Welcome to War Room, the official podcast of the U.S. Army War College online journal, graciously supported by the Army War College Foundation. Please join the conversation at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. We hope you enjoy the program. Hello, and welcome to the War Room Intelligence Series. I'm Genevieve Lester, and I'm the DeSario Chair of Strategic and Theater Intelligence here at the U.S. Army War College. We're here today to discuss Dave Oakley's new book, Subordinating Intelligence, the DOD-CIA Post-Cold War Relationship. Lieutenant Colonel Oakley is an assistant professor at the National Defense University's College of International Security Affairs in Washington, D.C. Thanks for joining us here at the War Room, Dave. Hey, Jen. Thanks for having me. So your book focuses on the relationship between the DOD and CIA, which is a fascinating topic. And I think one that we are very interested in here at the U.S. Army War College is we work to develop that relationship and an awareness of it. Uh, Can you introduce us to this topic from your expertise? Yeah, so, you know, a little bit... um I came across this topic when I was actually a SAM student. So, um, you know, I'm a former CIA officer um, and currently, as you said, a military officer. And I've always been fascinated um, about the two two cultures in their relationship. Um, although they both grew out, they have the, the shared OSS lineage, they're much, much different cultures. Um, so when I was a SAMS, I decided to um, pursue the, the background, the relationship. And so what that took me to is they took me to, you know, looking at the relationship really from the end of the Cold War, uh, Desert Storm time frame up until the, the 2012, the end of global war on terror. Oh, fantastic. So one of the, the changes over time that we've seen in that relationship is really the focus, the dynamic change in focus on supported military operations. And that seems to be a, a, that is a very core part of your argument in the book. Is that right? Can it, you talk about that? It is. So... Um, you know, when I first started researching this, I, I, I had the assumption that it was the post-9-11. It was the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq that really kind of pushed the relationships together, increased the, the support to the military from the intelligence community. Through my research, what I found is this this push towards uh, uh, intelligence support to the warfighter uh, began quite earlier. Uh, and in my book, I go back to the, to the 80s, the early 80s, around uh, the Beirut barracks bombing, um, the uh, invasion of Grenada, the same time that the discussion on increasing joint interoperability that leads to Goldwater Nichols. And I find that while Congress, uh, while uh, General David Jones was pushing for that, um, there was also discussion and a push towards increasing intelligence support to the warfighter. And so I begin the story then. I go through the 1990s, uh, the Desert Storm criticism of the CIA and other national intelligence, and then I look at structural changes that were put into place uh, in the 90s um, at the CIA, all focused to increasing the amount of intelligence support to the warfighter. Wow, that's a big job. Um, We've seen a lot of, of close inter- engagement between the two sides. For example, I mean, the, the famous one is the Osama bin Laden raid. Has that been a big change? that close relationship, has that been a big shocking change or was that a, de- a slow incremental development yeah. to get to that close relationship? So I think the change that I look at, so if you look at the CIA DOD relationship and you can go back to times like the Vietnam War with the, with, with Cords um, and Comer and uh, Colby and there was a relationship. I mean there was, but I would look at a lot of those o- operations as maybe concurrent operations and so they touched on each other. What I, f- what I found different with now um, is there's been this kind of it's no longer um, doing maybe mutual beneficial um, operations or even concurrent operations. Um, there's been more of a what I call a quasi subordination, um, and so you know more of a push um, that you saw in the 90s, argued for in the 80s of national intelligence collection for force protection, national intelligence collection for planning. Uh, in, in in my view, that's quite different than the previous relationship. So this concept of quasi, can you explore that for me a little bit, um, qu- how it differs from subordination? I mean, mm-hmm. w- what is the quasi part of this? There hasn't really, you know, no one would say that the CIA falls within, the, let's say, the combatant commander's chain of command, right? Um, and no one would say that the CIA is a, um, you know, a support activity. Uh, but when you start looking in the 90s, there's this really push about, you know, you need to collect intelligence to support um planning. You need to collect a force protection. So while they weren't, you know, 
uh, for lack of a better comparison. They, they weren't in the, you know, the, the line diagram chart. They were being told to do missions in support of the military. And so um, I came up with the term, you know, a quasi-subordination. So they're not saying you work for the combatant commander, but the expectations and what they provide is all in support of the commander. That makes sense. Um, I noticed this one sentence, and I may be struck by lightning by asking this question here at the Army War College, but there's a sentence in your book, military intelligence is important, but it is not the whole world. Yeah. Can you talk about this a little bit? Yeah, and I think if I remember back, I think I actually came from Senator David Boren. Uh, and so, you know, part of that was really fun with the research of this is I, I in a, ended up interviewing quite a few senior leaders in both the military, senior leaders in the intelligence community, and then senior policy leaders. And so one of the individuals I, I interviewed was, was Senator David Boren, um, who in the 90s, when a lot of this intelligence reform was going on, he was the Senate Select Committee of Intelligence Chair. And so he was actually one of the individuals early on that was, was pushing for a closer partnership. Um, he wanted the agency and the DOD to, 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 to talk more. He realized with the end of the Cold War there's going to be reductions, and so the level of redundancy is going to be the same. Um, but he also appreciated that, you know, it's just not about informing the commander. Um, and in my book I talk about, and I kind of came through this to my research, I started separating in my mind intelligence in kind of two, two categories. So I have intelligence for action and so that's to enable the warfighter um, as one former senior leader said to me that's to identify the guy behind the door and then you have intelligence for understanding and that's that's not to necessarily to enable action that's kind of to understand the broad world and some of the repercussions some of the the advantages the possibilities um, I think Boren's concern if I was to use those two ends of the spectrum, I guess. Um, he's, he was saying that, you know, it's not all about collecting intelligence to enable action. We need to understand the world so policymakers can make good decisions. And intelligence is a crucial part of that understanding. Absolutely. Just in, just to go back to your two categories, of course, I'm, I'm interested in strategic intelligence, as my title should suggest, and I'm interested in how covert action fits into that. Do you talk about this in your book? I don't. I don't, but it's interesting. So, you know, um, and I, I actually have a new article out in, um, in Small Wars and Insurgencies that looks at the early years of the CIA. Uh, it looks at covert action as was, was part of those early years. Um, so in the book, I don't t talk about it, but I am very fascinated because if you look at the intelligence for action, intelligence for understanding, and you look at the director of operations, from early on, um, you, they had these two missions. They had the covert action mission, and they had the foreign intelligence collection mission. Uh, and if you think about it, in one regard, you need to have intelligence to enable covert action, but also one is um, creating the world or trying to shape the world like you want it, and the other one is just trying to understand the world. And there is friction, and I argue in the, the paper there's been friction at times within the CIA and the culture between this, you know, um, the purpose of intelligence for covert action or, you know, um, to enable action, and the purpose of intelligence, foreign intelligence collection, is to understand the world. That's a great distinction. Yeah. That's, really, that's really clear, and it's something I think about a lot, too, in terms of the basic questions of the intelligence cycle, for the prototypical, whether it even exists or not, intelligence cycle and where covert action, where active measures, if you want to use a <laughs> Russian term, where that fits in. That's, really, that's a great distinction in how you put that together. Um, so we, you talk about the foundations of this relationship, and you talk about how it is rooted fairly deeply um, in the last couple of decades. Where are we now with this? Uh, so I, I think I think the relationship right now is pretty good, and that's one of the things I try to get across in the book. It's it's not that I'm arguing um, that there shouldn't be a relationship. I think you know as a taxpayer, I am happy that the relationship has improved. I'm happy um, that they work well together. Um, and so from that regard, working well together, having the affinity and the understanding of each other, it's very very positive. I think. Um, my concern currently, and I would really say it's even a broader concern, and I touch upon it a little bit in the book, is the militarization of U.S. foreign policy. And so this reliance on DOD 
And you've, you, I mean, you, you, you've seen, you know, recently Admiral Stavridis uh, was interviewed by NPR, and he talked about, you know, the, the latest budget with the president and his concern that we're too focused on DOD, and you know, DOD is is directing is you know being the leader in foreign policy. And there's been other senior leaders concerned with this too. And so my concern, and in the book, I actually tie this the the subordination, the quasi subordination of intelligence to this larger militarization of U.S. foreign policy. And so while on the grassroots ground, I think the relation is positive. I think it's pretty strong. I think that's one of the benefits of the of you know all I write about. On the other hand, my concern, and this is you know, I'm just speaking for me, um, not as my position as a military officer. Um, but one of my concerns is there's been too much of a militarization of U.S. foreign policy. So I, I put my literature, my book, I guess not my literature, my book within the category of literature that talks about militarization of U.S. foreign policy. That's really important, uh-huh. especially as we look at the, the relationship between the State Department and DOD, and it's pretty crucial there. So when we're talking about these issues, um, and we, we're talking about the, the global war on terror, and that's a, that's a core part of this argument, and, talk, and, and sort of disabusing us a little bit of the assumptions mm-hmm. about that. Now, as we adjust, one could argue, to near peer, we're shifting our focus, um, near peer competitors, uh, Russia, China. Will this change? Do you see, I, I guess I'm asking you to forecast, um, what do you see mm-hmm. based on, on the historical piece of your book and its argument? Where do you think we're going with that? Does this change? Does with, it have an effect? With the relationship? Exactly. Uh, I, it could. It could. I, I think it's pretty firm now. What I would, why I would say it's pretty firm now is you have generations of officers, um, and I can't t- tell you that's the top of my head, um, but a, a significant portion of the officers at the CIA are post-9-11. And so it's kind of became a way of life, this working with DOD and this partnership. Um, and so I think to some extent it's kind of ingrained in them. They've, they've been nurtured on this partnership. But that's not to say that it couldn't go the other way with more of a focus – on on uh, you know the broader um, pure com- competitors that you know really I mean you know Haspel uh, uh, Gina Haspel just spoke about going away from the, the 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 terrorism a little bit and focusing more on the pure pure competitors and so it could it could it could affect the partnership maybe now with that said I, I think it's a positive thing they're they're pushed towards the, you know pure competitors but I think it's a good question uh, I guess my I guess only time will tell. Well, it was an unfair question, <laughs> but forecasting, you know, it's yeah. kind of part of the business. But in, in back to the the concept too of of the support of military operations and what it crowds out, what that focus crowds out. So if it does, if if what are, what are things that are left out of that relationship? If we focus so much on the military, are we are we missing things? We talk a lot about the, sort of the tyranny of the current. Does this relationship? And I'm not. There's no value judgment in this that I'm asserting here, but. Does it affect long-term forecasting, strategic intelligence, those types of analyses? I think it does. And so I think you could use, you know, I think if you take Desaia Haspel's comments, she's acknowledged it does when it comes to Russia, China. Um, she, you know, it's, she's, she said it does. In my book, I mentioned a conversation I had with a, a senior leader who commented to me, you know, why we, we missed the um, Arab Spring? Why kind of surprised us? Because we were focused on CT and supporting the warfighter, and some people said to me, you know, they they when I would ask them that question, some of the senior leaders, they would say to me, well, I think the intelligence community, particularly the CIA, can chew gum and walk at the same time, which I understand their sentiment, but I think they're ignoring that, you know, one resource focused somewhere is one less resource focused somewhere else. And so by focusing so much on CT supporting the warfighter, you are having to, you know, assume risk uh, or accept costs, however you want to uh, phrase it, um, in other areas. And I think those areas have been this broader understanding of the world. Anything surprise you during the course of, of your research? I also do a lot of interviews, and there's always one that's, that sticks out. Anything you want to give us an anecdote or, or anything like that that was just a shock? Yeah, you know, I think, I think there's two things. So the first one, and I kind of knew this, but I didn't know it was to the extent, was the importance of individuals. And so, you know, there's a few people I'm kind of critical of in, in my research. I think fairly so, but one of the individuals uh, I was critical of was Rumsfeld um, and some of his subordinates, Boykin and, and Cambone. And I saw that the CIA-DOD relationship 
at that time because of policies and what I would say was parochialism on, on you know, largely um, by them was um, frustrating the relationship. But then in, they were replaced by Gates. They were replaced by, you know, uh, um, Vickers and others came in who had um, more of a, a collaborative view. Um, and so the relationship improved quite a bit. So that's one. I think the second one I found interesting as an intelligence-focused scholar was the concept of intelligence itself. And so one of the, when, when I first started, I've never been a military intelligence officer, so it had been a while since I actually worked as a practitioner in intelligence. And so the one of the first things I did is I went to an inter- intelligence and national security alliance conference. And, you know, I have a, a pretty specific definition of intelligence that sh- is shaped from my experience at the CIA as a human officer. As I sat there and listened to individuals from all the different ends, Signet, you know, Mazent, um, uh, you name it, when they would describe intelligence, there was always nuanced differences. And so I thought to myself, I'm, you know, when I, I walked away thinking we might have an intelligence community, but our separate views of what is intelligence is different in many regards. Um, and I think that's okay. Um, I think at the end of the day, intelligence is, you know, at its, at its, at its base level is information to enable decision making. And the information that I, you know, we use the DOD and the policymaker, but the information that a commander needs on the ground to enable action is quite different than what a um, policymaker needs to enable understanding so they can, you know, develop policy. Um, and so, um, why we have an intelligence community, and I think it's important that they talk, I think we should also appreciate the differences. That's great. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for being here today with us, Dave. Once again, for the world out there, shameless plug for Dave Oakley's book, Subordinating Intelligence, the DOD-CIA Post-Cold War Relationship, available at Amazon and other booksellers near you. Thanks again for being with us today. Hey, thank you, Jim, for this great opportunity. And that concludes our program. Thank you for listening. The views expressed in this podcast reflect those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views, policies, or positions of the U.S. Army or the Department of Defense. Let us know what you think. Provide us your feedback, comments, or suggestions through our webpage at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. And have a great day.